So, again, welcome, and uh, tonight I have uh, the pleasure of introducing our speaker, Dr. Steve Wilkins, who's been at APU for more than 30 years, and uh, he is a person who has a wonderful ability of balancing many different kinds of interests, concerns, values, skills, uh, a great scholar. He's always been an inspiration to me and others with his uh, scholarship. He's written over 10 books. He's currently working on a theology of humor, so this is a topic for which he has a great deal of interest uh, at this time. And um, he's a funny guy. Uh, he has been involved with a number of roasts where he is the MC, and he's uh, a person who uh, likes humor, incorporates humor daily into his life, incorporates humor into his teaching. And so uh, join with me as we welcome Dr. Wilkins. Really puts the pressure on when somebody says he's a funny guy. Uh, because since humor and laughter is going to be a large part of this, there's almost an absolute obligation to start off with a joke. So here goes. When I die, I want to go quietly in my sleep, like my grandpa, not yelling and screaming like the other people in his car. <laughs> okay, now it's a bit dark, but it's a good place to start because it has the classic structure of a joke. The first part is a setup. And in this case, it's a setup that draws you in because all of us have this fear that we will encounter a long and painful um, process of death, and we don't want that. So right away, you know, yeah, I want to go quietly in my sleep too. And then the punchline jerks you in a surprising direction, one you didn't expect to go. And for some reason, we like that, and it makes us laugh. Now, one of the first things you've probably realized is by standing here and analyzing the joke, I've just killed it. There's no faster way to suck all of the joy and pleasure out of humor than by analysis. So just be happy the lecture is not about sex. <laughs> anyway, I love humor and I love God. And I wanted these two objects of my affection to like each other. But that didn't really seem like it was gonna happen because after all, humor is fluffy, right? And theology, it's profound and holy. You even have to talk holy, you know, if you're going to talk about it. Theology's serious. Jokes are silly. Theology talks about all of life's big questions, and humor didn't seem to make the big question cut because for most of theology's almost 2,000 years of history, it has totally ignored humor. But when it's paid attention to it, usually it says kind of mean things about it. Let me give you a quote from St. Chrysostom. Laughter often gives birth to foul discourse, and foul discourse to actions still more foul. Often from words and laughter proceed railing and insult, and from railing and insult, blows and wounds, and from blows and wounds, slaughter and murder. I did not realize that laughter was a gateway drug to mayhem and genocide. And so I thought maybe I better back off, but I still couldn't let it go, because for me, Humor and laughter brings joy and hope, and anything that brings that, I kept saying, God must be in there somewhere. And one of the things that made me stay at least in the game is it's one of the primary ways I express love. So I will tell my wife, who, by the way, is here, uh, and my children, I love you frequently, but only infrequently with those three words. More often it comes in the form of gentle teasing, uh, sharing funny YouTube videos, or inflicting on my children the dreaded dad humor, which causes groans, and often they will say, I hate you, which means, through the translator, I love you. And if I said I love you to any of my friends, they would suspect that I had just been diagnosed with stage four cancer. But we do share affection by sharing funny anecdotes from the classroom or offbeat news stories that we've run across or trading insults 
when run through the magical prism of guy speak somehow come out as expressions of affection. In any case, humor is one of my primary love languages, and I'm sure that God is nearly not, as, not nearly as awkward as I am in expressing love, it made me suspect that perhaps humor is one of the ways God expresses his love for us. Awkward transition number one. I couldn't figure out why the baseball kept getting bigger and bigger, and then it hit me. <laughs> okay, what I've just committed there is a, a, a humor sin because, as we all know, the pun is the lowest form of humor. But even as the lowest form of humor, it requires one of the most complex, amazing intellectual skills that humans have because in order to get a pun, you have to flip through a Rolodex of possible meanings for words and identify where those two meanings clash. So in order for the joke to hit us, we engage in a highly complex intellectual process. But at the same time, it's simple enough that a second, second grader of average intelligence could understand it. And that was my passive aggressive way of getting back at all of you who didn't laugh at that pun. <laughs> okay, so what about more sophisticated forms of humor? Um, here's a joke I told to my Shih Tzu. Um, Adam felt shame because he had eaten of the forbidden fruit, so he covered himself up with a fig leaf. Eve too felt shame at eating the forbidden fruit, and she too covered herself with a fig leaf, and then went back into the forest and found some magnolia greenery, tried on a palm frond, and three varieties of mulberry leaves. Now Tofu the Shih Tzu didn't get the joke, but he's not very smart. My wife was convinced that this dog is smart, and so I checked out a canine intelligence scale. There are 141 breeds. Shih Tzus are 131 on the list. So I thought I might have better luck going to the top of the list, which was a Border Collie. Tried it with the Border Collie, still nothing. So why don't dogs get those jokes? And one of the reasons is, obviously, they lack the language skills necessary to process a joke like this, but there's a whole lot more. In order to make sense of this joke, you need to have some cultural and religious background to even understand who Adam and Eve were. You have to have the ability to comprehend the notion of shame. There are those moral categories that are required. Uh, you also have to have the capacity to put yourself in the position of another person who is feeling shame. You have to have this capacity for third person perspective. You have to have an awareness of gender stereotypes and you have to have an awareness that there is a thin line that separates the funny and offensive. And yes, I realize for some of you that joke may have been offensive. And I did it for demonstrative pur purposes. In any case, Tofu, my Shih Tzu, was not offended by it. And it's not because he's just an insensitive male. It's because human is a, humor is a solely human enterprise. And like humor, our spiritual sensitivity is also solely human. And both of these demand considerable intellectual, moral, social, and emotional horsepower. So all of this led me to think, uh, it led me to go a little bit deeper into the question. And I came up with six mysteries about why we don't see humor as an important theological resource or an important theological tool. Mystery number one, does the image of God giggle? Now, one of the big debates, the perennial debates about, um, ab about the Bible is what exactly is meant when humans are described as being made in the image of God, or if you want to sound really smart, in the Imago Dei. And the one thing that seems pretty clear is it is some capacity that is, is born by humans alone. So we might think of cognition, we might think of mutual relationship, we might think of 
uh, moral sensibility or creativity or aesthetic judgment or volition. Um, and because of this, we have theologies of that deal with all of these areas. We have a theology of music and art and culture and language, worship, politics, and economics. But here's the thing. If humor uses all of these amazing image of God capacities invested in humans, why isn't there anything on humor and theology? I'm pretty much convinced that the first bearers of God's image had a sense of humor. And if nothing else, we have to consider it somewhat funny that they were both naked in the garden and what tempted them was fruit. And they probably had to think that was a little bit funny too when viewed in hindsight. There's a pun in there somewhere. <laughs> Mystery number two, the search for integrating our personality. Think about what happens when we laugh. So for example, if somebody would say, cured ham? Apparently not, or we wouldn't be eating it. Okay, so what goes on if you find that funny, which apparently most of you didn't, um, you have this very complex neurological activity that requires that we recognize that two different definitions of the word cured clash together and somehow uh, that brings about activity within the facial muscles when we smile. My emotional status brightens. I feel a sense of connection with the speaker. When we laugh, it stimulates blood flow, reduces stress, and if it elevates to the level of a full belly laugh, we even burn a few calories. In other words, humor and laughter is a whole person, whole body integrated sort of activity that brings our spiritual, moral, intellectual capacities into sync with our optic nerves and our glandular systems, and all of this with no negative side effects. So, when I read the Bible, I am told that we're supposed to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and body. And that and in there, I think, is pretty important. It's not multiple choice. It's not or. You don't choose one of the four. Instead, the ideal is that, that our, our love of God encompasses every dimension of our being. So, when Mary is visited by the angel and given this amazing news that she holds within her womb the Savior, her response was to say, or to sing, my heart magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Do you suppose she said that with a scowl, or a somber expression? Was she just laughing on the inside? Did her psychological outlook, adrenaline level, and pulse rate remain the same? Or is it possible that throughout the pregnancy, she smiled and maybe even laughed out loud at the odd and wonderful news of what was happening. Did the world around her seem new and different? The point is this, humor brings the diverse dimensions of our being into congruence with each other. So what are the implications of that unity building uh, capacity within humor for a faith that is also supposed to bring every dimension of our life into a worship of God. Mystery number three, the quest for love. Have you ever heard a joke that was just so funny you couldn't wait to tell somebody else? This is one that discovered me a few years back when my kids were teenagers. And the joke is this. The Bible says absolutely nothing about how old Isaac was when his father, Abraham, received the call from God to sacrifice him. But biblical scholars are pretty sure that Isaac was not yet a teenager. Why is this? Because after they're teenagers, it's no longer a sacrifice. <laughs> now, the folks who seem to have the most appreciation for this joke were those who had kids in that adolescent period of their life. Because even when they're great kids, like mine were because of my superior parenting skills, it's still challenging. 
And it opened up doors and opportunities to share together those struggles that we faced as parents and trying to kind of relearn how to be parents all over again. But the reality is that humor has magnetic properties. Let me give you uh, some information from a few studies. Those on Match.com, both male and female, list as the most desired quality in a potential mate is a sense of humor. That studies have shown that those who enjoy laughter and have a good sense of humor are perceived as warm, caring, and above average in intelligence. Those who laugh easily and bring laughter are judged to be more loving and caring people. And 90% of our laughter occurs in the presence of others. Humor and laughter is often a lubricant that allows us to discuss really difficult issues. Because somehow when we laugh, that draws people together. It tends to minimize the things that might otherwise separate us. And in a day um, where the walls that separate us seem to get thicker and higher, it seems like we ought to investigate the power of humor in building those bridges, if not just a few Match.com marriages. If humor makes us seem, appear more loving, intelligent, caring, connected, isn't this a language that we use, should use to speak of God's love? Mystery number four. Did we lose Easter somewhere? Um, a grandmother was a bit concerned about the spiritual welfare of her young granddaughter uh, and was, was worried that maybe she was losing the religious significance of some of the holidays. So she, she uh, had a conversation with this granddaughter and said, Honey, can you tell me why we celebrate Thanksgiving? And the young girl said, Well, yeah, Thanksgiving is the day when the pilgrims said thank you to the Native Americans who helped them get through the year. And the grandma was a bit worried, so she pressed on. And she says, why do we celebrate Christmas? And the little girl says, oh, that's easy. That's when we celebrate the birthday of Santa Claus. <laughs> and now grandma was still really starting to worry, but she's gonna try one more time. Says, okay, honey, what's Easter all about? And the little girl said, that's when we celebrate Jesus coming out of the tomb. Grandma breathed a sigh of relief, and then the young girl said, and if he sees his shadow, that means we have six more weeks of winter. <laughs> we experience plenty of evil, suffering, injustice, oppression, and death, and Christians have those pretty well covered. We could do better, but we do pretty good at that. We have grief classes, t trauma recovery groups, we've got rescue missions, food pantries, social justice organizations, and we should, it's all good. Because each new day seems to bring a twisted version of Groundhog Day that has echoes of Good Friday's death and evil. But for Christians, Darkness and death isn't the only reality. It's not even the primary reality. Because Good Friday would not be good unless we could look back through the window of Easter and resurrection. Without resurrection, uh, the proper response to Good Friday is to double up on your anti-depression medication and to curl into a fetal ball. So what is the reversal of suffering, mourning, and tears? Can it be anything other than elation, joy, and uncontrollable laughter? And in a double sense, it's not just happiness at the reversal of the tragic, but it's the realization that what seems so final doesn't get the last word. So in those ministries that are aimed at those who hurt and suffer, what is the goal? Should not the goal be the giddiness that is characteristic of the resurrection life? Shouldn't our spiritual life be infused with joy, laughter, and humor? One of the most dangerous forms of humor is mockery. But I think we ought to join with Paul when he raises his finger to death and says, Where, O oh death, is your sting? Mystery number five. Humor is a power tool. 
And since you've brought the topic up, why are men like power tools? They're almost impossible to get started, and once you do, they never work right. <laughs> God has invested many things in creation with a great deal of power. Money, sex, politics, art, other things. And one of the things that we know is all of those, all of those tools, if used properly, can bring about terrific good. But conversely, if used poorly, they can bring havoc and destruction. Humor's powerful. It brings people together, but the dark side is it can destroy humans as well. Laughter can, uh, can wound, it can even kill. And if for no other reason, Christians ought to give humor very serious thought. It's quite powerful. So one of the phrases I have heard numerous times during my life is, why should the devil have all the good music? <laughs> but in true Christian fashion, we can't agree on where that saying originated. Uh, I took a look at the Amazon top 100 list of books on religious humor. And in the vast majority of cases, humor is used to mock and denigrate faith and people of faith, and quite powerfully. How can we harness the power of humor and laughter as a vehicle for faith? After all, why should the devil have all the good humor? Number six, mystery number six, we just like to laugh. When I was a kid and I had to go to the dentist's office or the doctor's office, the first thing I would do is grab Reader's Digest and read all the joke pages. Now, most of the things from my younger life have tended to lose their sparkle, but I still love humor. And the reality is everybody likes to laugh. Our capacity to giggle emerges at a very early age and remains with us until death. If there is a culture that exists that lacks humor and appreciation for it, we don't know about it. Uh, the earliest joke that we know of goes back to 10,000 BC. And this may be way too much information, but it's a fart joke. <laughs> Some things just don't change. The point of all of this is humor is a desirable dimension of our life but we don't talk about its place very much in Christian life. If for no other reason than it temporarily distracts us from the scream of the dentist drill in the next room, it plays a useful social function. But I think there's a lot more than that because it brings joy to us, enhances our, our, our health. It brings about and, and fosters friendship and it brings texture to our life. If God is the giver of all good gifts, and we intuitively perceive humor as a good, good gift, I think we ought to pay a little bit more attention to it. So here's the summary for this section. I shouldn't say summary. You're all going to think you're going to get out of here. Um, the summary is that humor shows up in all of the things that we love and in the most profound things we do. So this seems to indicate that we ought to take it seriously as people of faith. But I think there's more. And so I'm going to stretch you a little bit and say, what if God is something of a jokester? And the Christian story is full of triggers that are at the core of humor. What makes humor work? Well, it's stuff like violating or challenging boundaries. It's reversal. It's incongruity. It's irony. It's paradox. You don't have to work very hard to find that in the Bible, folks. So if you're not used to reading scripture as humor or viewing God as a joke teller, you might want to check with Jonah, at least if he's in a better mood now than he was after his Ninevite revival meetings. Awkward transition number two. An escalator can never break. It can only become stairs. You would never see an escalator temporarily out of order sign, just escalator temporarily stairs. Sorry for the convenience. We apologize for the fact that you can still get up there. Okay, I've stolen that from Mitch Hedberg, who is a master 
at writing comedy. He's even better at delivering it, obviously. Uh, and you know, your silence was one of the reasons that uh, comedy shops have a two drink minimum. Um, <laughs> but you have the setup and then you have the punchline, but a really good comedian will follow it up with toppers and this one has three of them. It just kind of keeps building and building. Um, I think it helps us maybe understand jo Jonah, the book of Jonah, a little bit better if we read it as a setup, a punchline, followed by one topper after another. Okay, so here's the setup. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. What do you expect the prophet to do? Go to Nineveh. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. So if Nineveh is east, Tarshish is uh, west by northwest. Okay, is this what you expect a prophet to do? It's rhetorical, by the way. The man called by God, preparing to be God's servant, is doing just the ex uh, exactly the opposite as God has called him to do. And by the way, if anybody should know that uh, trying to hide from God is a pretty low success proposition, a prophet ought to know this. So you're wondering why HR didn't vet this guy a little better. Okay, the other thing that we expect of a prophet is that they are so tightly attuned to the voice of God they hear it even when it comes in hints and whispers. So God sends a message to Jonah in the form of a huge storm. And this storm is so severe that the, the crew, which happens to be pagan, by the way, is deathly afraid that they are going to all die. And where's Jonah? He's dead asleep, totally clueless, in the bowels of the ship. Quite a prophet we have here. Um, and so when the crew comes down to apprise him of the situation, Jonah says, I'm your problem. See, this is the odd thing that we don't expect. Jonah knows that God knows, but he still thinks he can run away. Silly prophet. Um, so Jonah, in a brief moment of nobility, says, I'm the problem. Chuck me overboard. And so what does this pagan group of sailors do? Well, if I'm one of them, I'm saying, okay, you're causing this. I am blameless. You're going overboard. They acted morally. And they tried to row against the storm. And that wasn't successful. And finally, Jonah said, look, you know, I know this God well enough to know you're not going to beat it. So they threw him overboard. And then what do they do? I hope you've got your, your irony meters set here because they should peg at about 10. The pagan sailors offer sacrifices to Jonah's God, the same God that Jonah is running away from. Now that's kind of funny. So here's Jonah in the roiling waters facing certain death, and God sends salvation in the oddest way, and we all know this story. He sends a big fish to swallow him. And so after three days down in the guts of this big fish, Jonah comes around a little bit and offers a nifty prayer of thanksgiving to God for sending this salvation. And after this attitude adjustment, it says, the big fish vomited Jonah onto dry land. And then it says Jonah obeyed the Lord and went to Nineveh. But it still doesn't seem that he's all in because here's what we find out next. When he gets to the city, he preaches the shortest, most uninspiring evangelistic sermon you could ever come up with. In Hebrew, it is five words. In English, it translates something like this. Forty more days and Nineveh will be destroyed. Does that move you to repentance? <laughs> well, I don't know whether it was just the power of the words themselves or the fact that Jonah probably still reeked of half-digested half carp and sardines. But the Ninevites responded in a big way. 
uh, all the way from the, the king down the, the food chain to the common people. As a matter of fact, it was even more dramatic than that. It goes all the way down into the literal food chain because it says the Ninevites put sackcloth showing repentance on their livestock, on their sheep and goats. Now, when repentance gets all the way down to the livestock uh, level, it seems to be sincere, doesn't it? And God did something amazing. The Ninevites repented and God relented. So up to this point, we have a very strange story that has a happy ending, and in many ways, we just wish it would stop there, but it gets weird again. Because apparently, Jonah doesn't like happy endings for Ninevites, and he has a beef with his boss. So he turns to God and says, I knew you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. See, Jonah is disappointed with God because God refused to go ballistic on one of the Hebrew people's arch enemies. And so he tells God, I just want to die, and goes right out to the edge of the city limits and sits there and pouts. Now, God gives him a small act of mercy by allowing a vine to grow up over him and provide some shade, and now he's kind of happy again, but overnight... God sends a divinely commissioned bug to chew through the the vine and the vine dies. And the next day, Jonah is sitting out there in the sun. And once again, he's in full, I just want to die mode. You get less drama from a hormonal 14-year-old. See, nowhere in Jonah do things work out the way they're supposed to. The punchline whiplash is followed by one topper after another. The hated Ninevites and their bovines repent, and there's no reason to expect they would do that from a grumpy foreigner with an unenthusiastic sermon. The pagan Gentile soldiers act morally, and they show proper respect and sensitivity toward God. And the hero of the story turns out to be a moral and spiritual zero. And if you read that with, without a big smile on your face, I'm beginning to wonder whether you've read it rightly because it's a funny story. But don't get me wrong, it's a very serious story. Um, one of the hazards of teaching philosophy at a Christian college like I do is you will hear quite frequently the little phrase from Isaiah, well, God's ways are not our ways. And a lot of times that's students looking for an excuse not to think, but they need to make it sound more religious to justify it. Now, I'm going to agree with that, that God's ways are not our ways, but I don't think it means stop thinking. Instead, I think it means think differently. And one of the things I like about humor is it allows us to think a little bit differently. So here's our way. Our way is to rejoice when our enemies get nuked. God's way is to back off as soon as they repent and say they're sorry. We find out that God's ways are loving to the outsiders. And we sometimes find out that the people we're supposed to hate are a lot more spiritually attuned to God than even the most inside of the insiders, folks like Jonah and us. God's ways are gracious, and I'm pretty sure he wants us to know that. See, quite often we are quite concerned about all of the powers that, that uh, the Ninevehs of this world have. But God's way is to remind us that the Ninevehs and the Pharaohs and the Babylons and the Romes have power that is only paper thin. Our way is to look for sparkling res- resumes and great GPAs. God specializes in recruiting the least expected for the big jobs. How many times do you see that throughout the Bible? Uh, Folks who seem totally unqualified. And we also find out that God forgives and uses big jerks like Jonah for big jobs. God does work in mysterious ways, but these are funny mysteries. Now, if we're accustomed to God's ways, it doesn't really surprise us that God surprises us. Reversal, paradox, violation of the norms, those are all par for the course when it comes to God's ways. 
They only seem weird to us if we take the usual view of the world. But humor, I think, helps us see the logic of God. Okay, another awkward transition. A mother makes a frantic call to 911 and says, please send help. My young child had just swallowed a needle. And so the operator says, we've dispatched an ambulance. They'll be there in five minutes. But two minutes later, the dispatcher gets another call, and the mother says, you can cancel the ambulance. I found another needle. <laughs> OK. Now, in addition to helping us understand God's ways, I think tool, uh, that humor may be a tool for helping us understand ourselves. See, here's the thing. God saves Jonah, gives his job back, uses him to save 125,000 souls, and at the end, Jonah still doesn't get it. So I can just imagine this scenario. I tell my kids, gee, don't you think Jonah should have been happy? And their response would have been, amazing insight, Captain Obvious. And what makes the story so funny is that Jonah is so completely oblivious to what should have been completely obvious to any reader. And so one of the the things that we find out is if the punchline to that last joke would have been cancel the ambulance, I found a nickel, it wouldn't have been near as funny. Uh, because there really is no obvious connection between finding a nickel and still having a needle lodged in some child's esophagus. Um, but what makes the story of Jonah funny is that he is a God follower. And a God follower should know that what has happened in Nineveh is a cause for great celebration. So we go all judgmental on him. We even get a little bit angry with him. But the danger is when we do this, we hold him at arm's length. And so Jesus had to tell the Jonah story again in a slightly different form that involved a wayward son, a forgiving father, and a resentful older brother. OK, I've been going for a while, so we need a little audience participation here. So you've got to help me out. You'll know the cues. Knock, knock. Who's there? Jesus. Jesus well, I guess we know who's going to hell in this room. <laughs> OK, now, knock, knock jokes are pretty, usually pretty innocuous and silly. But this one catches us by surprise because it puts us on the spot rather unpleasantly so. And we didn't see it coming. And in the same way with the prodigal son story, we wish it would just stop with the son returning home and the father welcoming him. Because let's be honest, that older brother part is a bit of a buzzkill. Uh, but the prodigal son and the Jonah joke both have the same punchline. Somebody who should know better just doesn't get it. And so again, we're tempted to condemn the older brother because after all, he's been around. He should know the family values. Humor requires participation. We have to see ourselves in the, in the characters. Um, and what happens is the folks we assume should be the, the heroes of the story end up being more lost than a bunch of Ninevites who don't know their right hand from the left, or uh, the prodigal son who has spent the last few months competing with pigs for, for lunch. See, the Christian life is not a spectator sport where we call fouls and keep score from the sidelines. Faith and humor both require vulnerability. We have to allow ourselves to be drawn in. And I think, again, humor helps us. Because with humor, when we understand who we are, when we are revealed in our true self, we have to laugh at the absurdity of it all. But this laughter always is conditioned by an awareness that redemption is possible. And redemption, which laughs in joy, also has to keep in mind that there is the absurdity of sin behind us. Um, so, as the old saying goes, confession without repentance is just bragging. Uh, we need to celebrate in laughter and enjoy our redemption, but also we need the sarcastic laughter at, uh, at the foolishness of our own rebellion. Because we are so spiritually dense, 
God has to sneak up in the story of Jonah and in the story of the prodigal son and surprise us. So the joke's on us, but the joke is also for us. The truth of our life is often painful, and quite often it is by humor that we confess why we suffer this pain. But the laughter of surprise comes from God's grace because we recognize that it benefits us. So the prodigal's dad says to the older brother and to us, we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Joyful laughter in the presence of redemption isn't optional. It's mandatory. God welcomes the wayward Ninevites and the prodigal son home. Thank you. I think there are a number of reasons. One is that laughter is a very physical, bodily sort of thing. And I think quite often Christians have had uh, an untheological, incorrect uh, fear of anything associated with the body. And in some ways, I think that's why we get by with talking about joy because we can act like joy is simply an internal thing. So I think there is that element. Uh, I also think it is uh, because of some of the misuses of humor. And so we didn't spend a lot of time talking about it, but there is a dark side to humor. And it can be harmful. Um, yeah, and I feel like I'm, I've got a list in my notes of about 10 different reasons I believe that, that Christians have often been wary of humor, and it's not coming up. I'm not confused, I'm just buffering, and it's not loading, downloading for me. Um, but that, that'd be a place to start. Now, um, the oldest existing joke book comes from like the third or fourth century A.D., um, and one of the things that is in uncanny is that the sorts of things that were subject to joking today were found back then. There are a lot of raunchy sex jokes and body odor jokes. And uh, what would be the equivalent of dumb blonde or Pollock jokes or whatever? Apparently, the Abderites had a reputation of not being very bright. So in many ways, the, the subject of joking still remains the same. Yeah, so how can we use comedy, uh, humor, in a way that is productive, God-honoring, rather and, and avoid going over into the dark side? Um, I think a lot of it is just being attuned to looking at things a second time, seeing what isn't immediately obvious. Um, See, one of the, the amazing claims that Christianity makes is that God has given us a superpower, that we can see the invisible, that we can see God present and at work in the world. But in order to do that well, you have to use the same tool that a comedian uses. Uh, and that is, you have to uh, live with your eyes wide open, ask a different set of questions. Let me just give you one experience that I had a few months back. Um, my office is on the floor right above and almost immediately above us is a bookcase with a bunch of books and I walked past that thing a hundred times and being the nerd I am, I'd kind of check out the titles as I went by. And one of the titles was one you, you would, not, uh, would not surprise you to find on a college campus. It was a book called How to Read a Book. But one day I saw something that I had never seen before. It, I noticed that this was a lot thicker than most books. So I stopped and opened it up, and it was indeed how to read a book on tape. <laughs> okay, so now the irony is that you can learn how to read a book without ever reading a book, okay? 
And it's just one of those things that you walk past every day and you never quite see because um, you tend to look at just uh, what you find on the surface. And so that got me started thinking, well, this book has been highly successful, so why don't I re uh, write a book called How to Read, How to Read a Book? <laughs> and I could do a video version. So you don't actually ha have to read a book to figure out how to read, how to read a book. And then I started wondering whether there's the logical impossibility of an infinite regress of how to read, how to read books. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is it's, uh, it's living, uh, looking for those hints of something that you don't expect. Uh, a lady runs into a, a business that has a help wanted sign in the window and says, what's wrong? <laughs> okay, now, help wanted, we can take that so many different ways, can't we? And if you listen to stand-ups, they will take something that is so ordinary, something so mundane, and they'll see another dimension, and that's what we as Christians are called to do. Uh, in terms of how to stay on the, the light side, um, I'm not sure I can get a give a full list of hard and fast rules, but if it builds people up, if it brings joy, if it allows you to share insight, if it allows you to connect with them, uh, then you're doing all the sorts of things we're called as Christians to do. Yeah, well, irony is there uh, in the very notion that the God who speaks uh, and the universe begins to exist also comes to us as an infant. Now that's ironic. It's ironic that the power of death is defeated not by uh, guns or money or anything like that, but by death itself and sacrifice. Uh, one of the funniest portions in the Bible is in Revelation. Who is worthy to open the scroll? Only the lion is worthy. You know, it's like, you need the lion. And who shows up? A bloody lamb. Okay? Now, this is a wonderful commentary on uh, what we normally think of as power. Uh, because, you know, when we think of power, we think of some ferocious carnivore, and what we get is a beaten, bloodied ovine. And it's, it's kind of funny. But there's all sorts of stuff in the Bible. There's, there's mockery. Think of the... Uh, um, uh, the, the ridicule of the prophets of Baal. And unfortunately, our translations tend to clean things up, but one of the, the barbs is, so where are your gods? Apparently, they had to go to the bathroom and relieve themselves and you know didn't show up in time. Um, you get that sort of thing. You get a lot of wordplay. Um, so um, Abel is um, condemned to go live in the land of Nod, which means wandering. Uh, he's supposed to settle down in a place of wandering. Uh, it's a little uh, play on words there. But, uh, but the, the, the thing that I'm looking for, it's, it's still there in a lot of places in Scripture. You see humor if, if you're attuned to it. But my bigger point, my bigger project in this is to look for the tools that make, um, that make humor work and also find them throughout scripture. It's what I would call a humorous hermeneutic. Uh, so instead of reading scripture trying to mine humor from it, we read it humorously, an adverbial approach to it. Uh, because there are so many things that we have read in scripture and we lose the freshness, we lose the shock value. And, and so, uh, yeah, reading it through the grid, the lens of, of humor. Well, thank you all for coming and let's uh, thank you.